Yeah, so welcome everyone to the crypto session. Um, we'll have three talks and we'll start with Nishant, who's going to tell us about fully DI quantum key distribution from synchronous correlations. So please go ahead. So hi everyone, welcome to my talk. This is joint work with uh, Brad Lackey. And uh, here's a quick outline of the talk. We haven't had a lot of QKD talks so far, so I'll do a brief overview of QKD and then introduce what device independence means. And then I'll talk a little bit about non-local games and introduce uh, synchronous correlations. Then I'll describe the protocol and then talk about some of the challenges with the protocol. So it's a synchronous protocol. What happens if we have asynchronicity? And um, also talk about the causality loophole, which is common loophole in uh, device independent protocols. So in QKD, you have two parties, Alice and Bob whose goal is to establish a shared classical secret key. And they are allowed to share uh, quantum resources. They can also uh, communicate classically. There is uh, an adversary, typically uh, called Eve, in the system that is trying to get information about the key. And broadly, they have two main requirements. The first one is correctness. So they want to end up with the same key. So Ka should be equal to Kb. And security, which means that Eve must get little to no information about the key. In device independence, what we have is that Alice and Bob don't trust their devices. So it's possible that the adversary actually programmed the devices herself. Um, and the security of the protocol is based only on the correctness of quantum mechanics, uh, the physical separation of devices, which means that we enforce this uh, non-signaling condition. Um, Alice and Bob are physically separated. And passing of statistical tests known as Bell tests uh, or Bell inequalities. And so what these are, they sort of help us establish the separation between classical and quantum. So if there is a violation of the Bell inequality, then we know that there is something quantum going on. And some of the challenges uh, are that the communication between the devices is public. Um, they still have those goals from before. They, they want to establish a shared secret key. So they one correctness and security, and we want a protocol that's efficient and also robust to some noise. So typically in DIQKD, what we do is we model these devices as boxes that take in inputs. So Alice takes in XA, Bob takes XP, and then they produce outputs, uh, Y and YB. And there is an Eve in the system that is trying to guess, in this case, Alice's output. Um, the blue squiggly lines denote that they can actually share entanglement, and then the red lines indicate that they cannot communicate with each other once they receive their inputs. Um, and typically, the security in protocols like this is established using something known as uh, monogamy of entanglement, which means that if two parties are maximally entangled, then no third party can have any correlations with them. OK, so overall, the protocol um, is as follows. You have Alice and Bob and also Eve. Uh, they are separated physically, uh, denoted by these red lines. Uh, they may share entanglement, so they start with an EPR pairs, for example. And then they carefully choose these rounds known as testing rounds. And in these rounds, they'll test the violation of the Bell inequality. And so if the Bell inequality is violated, they can certify that they must have shared maximally entangled states. And so the other rounds uh, give them the key bits. So the other rounds of the protocol are data rounds, and they use those to, to get the raw key. And then they do some more post-processing communication and uh, privacy amplification to get the final key. OK, so what are non-local games? Uh, a non-local game is characterized by four things. Uh, the input set, uh, where they draw their inputs from. Uh, the set of outputs uh, for Alice and Bob. Uh, there's a probability distribution on the, on the set of inputs. And a decision predicate that takes in all the inputs and outputs, and uh, outputs a bit. Zero if they lose the game, and uh, one if they win the game. And so you can think of a non-local game as this uh, correlation or probability distribution. Um, P of Y, A, Y, B, given X, A, X, B. And we are looking to maximize the value of the game. And the value of the game is given by the summation over all of the outputs and all of the inputs. 
um, of the decision predicate times the probability of getting those outputs given the inputs and also the probability of those inputs. So what are synchronous correlations? Uh, a synchronous correlation formally is one where uh, if you're given the same input, so if Alice and Bob both get inputs x, then the probability that they produce different outputs is zero. And so this defines a non-local game where the winning condition is um, one in every other case, but the case that they receive the same inputs but produce different outputs. And so there, the fact is that synchronous classical correlations always exist. So you can always win the synchronous non-local game classically with probability one. So that you don't have the same sort of gap that you would have in a, in a game like CHSH where the probability of winning classically is something like 75%, but quantumly is more than that, 85. Um, so synchronous belt tests are not about computing the value of the game. Uh, what we do show is that there are four synchronous bell inequalities, and we call them uh, J0, J1, J2, J3. And uh, classically, all of these Js are non-negative, uh, non but in the quantum case, you can actually violate that and go all the way up to minus one-eighth. And so we also show a rigidity result uh, or self-testing result that says that if you do get a maximal violation of minus one eighth, then the parties must share uh, the EPR pair. Okay, so here's the, uh, here's the synchronous DIQKD protocol. Uh, Alice and Bob start with uh, EPR pairs. Uh, they draw their inputs from this set zero, one, two. Uh, they produce outputs, and I'll show the strategy that they use to produce their outputs. Um, they use a synchronous correlation, which means that the probability of generating different outputs given the same inputs is zero. And because they're synchronous, if they do get the same inputs, they must produce uh, the same uh, outputs. And that gives them the key bit. Um, in the case that they get different inputs, they test the violation of the Bell inequality. And I've shown here J3, which is just one minus one fourth of the sum over all of the inputs that are different and the outputs that are different, the probability of getting those outputs given those inputs. Uh, and again, classically, this is always non-negative. But in the quantum case, if you get a violation of uh, negative one eighth, then it's a certificate that Alice and Bob must share a maximally entangled state. So here are the projection values that they use. Uh, if they get a zero, then they just measure in the computational basis. Uh, if they get one, then they measure in this pi by three rotated basis uh, and minus pi by three rotated basis for uh, two. And so note that their strategy is symmetric, so Alice and Bob aren't really doing anything different from each other, like in the CHSH game where they're uh, doing different strategies. Um, their roles are completely interchangeable. And we get a nice uh, formula for the probability, this one given by the Born rule, but because we have synchronicity, we get a nice uh, tracial formula like this for the probability. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about synchronicity. Um, so we actually show that if you don't violate the Bell inequality exactly, but there is some noise uh, given by this lambda, um, then the strategy used to produce that correlation must actually be close to the one that uh, produces the ideal correlation. And so what happens, we've assumed so far that Alice and Bob are, syn are synchronous. So what happens if the correlation is actually not synchronous? Can you actually produce maximal Bell violations without uh, using maximally entangled state? And the answer is yes. You, can, you don't even have to be quantum to do that. You can use uh, an asynchronous classical correlation to produce a maximal Bell violation. So this introduces a loophole in, in the protocol where now we have to compute the asynchronicity. Uh, and the asynchronicity is just given by the probability of getting, or the average probability of getting different outputs given the same inputs. And so we measure this value, and if it's above a certain threshold, then we abort the protocol. But if it is below, 
then we can actually extend the rigidity result uh, to sort of this almost synchronous case. Okay. And so um, the proof of security follows uh, directly from an application of the, the entropy accumulation theorem, also known as the EAT. Um, I won't show the, the full key rates and the, the min entropy uh, formulas, but I do want to show you a plot. So basically, uh, the key rate is given by the length of the key generated divided by the number of rounds. And here I plot uh, the key rates for different values of n. And so you can see that uh, we can actually tolerate some asynchronicity before we get uh, to sort of a, a negative key rate um, in the case that n is equal to 10 to the 8. And as you increase n, we are actually able to tolerate more asynchronicity. And so in the case of 10 to the 15, we can go all the way up to um, something like 4.6%. Okay. And so um, there is a common loophole in DIQKD protocols where we make the assumption of uh, non-signaling, right? So we assume that Alice and Bob are acausally separated, and so they cannot communicate with each other once they receive their inputs. And so what happens if that assumption is violated? Um, and there are some results uh, known that Eve can actually simulate this uh, quantum correlation or this maximally uh, maximal violation of the Bell inequality just using classical communication. So if this assumption of non-signaling uh, is violated, then we also don't have the certificate that we got from uh, the Bell violation. And so previous works or practical implementations, what they do is they'll make sure that Alice and Bob are separated by a far enough distance so that even light cannot travel between them within a specific amount of time. And so um, that's how they sort of get around this loophole. But instead of doing that, what we do is we pose a new security assumption. Um, Eve can have as much communication as she wants, and Eve doesn't even have a, ability, a computational we don't limit Eve's computational abilities. Uh, but we say that she has some uncertainty about Alice and Bob's uh, inputs. So this means that the probability of Eve guessing x prime given Alice or Bob selects x is 1 minus epsilon. So there is this like, little bit of uncertainty about Alice and Bob's inputs. And so Eve has unlimited computational power. She has unlimited communication. She can use any strategy she wants to produce uh, her output bits. Uh, she has her own correlation because uh, she's producing these outputs and she's making these guesses for Alice and Bob's bits. Uh, we let lambda be sort of the error or the noise tolerance for the Bell inequality and mu uh, be the noise tolerance for the asynchronicity. And so we can actually show that there is, exists a function of this mu and lambda such that if Eve's uncertainty grows more than this epsilon max, which is given by 2 thirds minus f of mu and lambda, then there is no correlation that Eve can use. So what happens is if she tries to satisfy these bounds, every correlation she can come up with has negative asynchronicity. And that's a contradiction because no probability distribution can have negative asynchronicity. Um, and so I just want to quickly uh, show, show a plot of how much her uncertainty can grow uh, before there is no, no cheating strategy. And so if we tolerate no uh, asynchronicity, then she must have perfect information. She should know exactly what Alice and Bob's inputs are. But if you tolerate a little bit more asynchronicity, something like 4.5%, then Eve still needs close to perfect knowledge. So here, I think that's about 3.5%. So she needs close to 96.5% certainty about Alice and Bob's inputs. So yeah, that actually brings me to the end of my talk. Um, I'll take any questions. All right, thank you very much for that great talk. Um, questions? 
Right, let me start with one while people are thinking. So this rigidity result that you show, um, like, can you say more about how you show that and how that relates to this paper of, of Vidic on like almost synchronous correlations? Yeah, so um, let me quickly go back. Yeah, so basically you can use, the same as C, something like CHSH, you can use uh, two projections theory or Jordan's lemma to show that Alice and Bob's strategy must be a qubit strategy, and then uh, if you have a maximal violation, then you, the state that you use must be the EPR pair. Okay, but so that's like specific for this like two input setting, like the Jordan lemma technique? What's that? The, this like Jordan's lemma thing is specific to this two input setting, I guess. Like, two, could you generalize this to output arbitrary? Two setting, yes. Uh, sorry, to output setting, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I guess what I was referring to is there's this paper by, by Tom Vidic on like rigidity of almost synchronous correlations or right. something of that sort, which seems to be much more like general. So I'm kind of wondering what the relation between that and, and your rigidity theorem is. Um. So we almost use uh, that work as a as a black box and say that. Oh, okay. I think yeah I think I I can't remember if it's specific to the two output setting or not but um, yeah I think we can show that if you have bounded asynchronicity then you can extend the rigidity result. Pretty, it's yeah. It's, I think it's pretty straightforward. Okay, but like that one doesn't give you the actual rigidity that you need. Like it's it's too weak in terms of the self-testing statement that it gets. I guess. Uh, the the Vidic. Yeah. Um, I think it's it's very general. So I think you can plug in uh, any self-test. I think and extend it to the synchronous case. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any other questions from people in the audience? Yes. Thank you. Um, maybe I missed something, but you said you justify the correctness of your protocol because the, the correlations that they have are synchronous, mm -hmm. no? So that, but then what happens when you allow for a bit of asynchronicity? Like how do you ensure that they have the same key or how do you remove when the, the, the part when they don't get the same key? Yeah, so I mean, I was just saying, so you can measure the asynchronicity using this, uh, this measure, and then if it's above a certain threshold, then you just abort. Okay, but is it not true that if it's not zero, there's a possibility that they get different keys? I think you still do the standard information reconciliation and privacy. Okay, so you do the standard. Yeah, yeah, yeah you yeah, do okay. the. Yeah, I, I skip those steps. Here, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, you still do those steps. Yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you. All right, thanks. Um, any quick final questions? Um, maybe let me just like. Oh, okay. Um, so you said that Eve is allowed to do arbitrary amounts of classical communication mm -hmm. as long as she has some uncertainty about the inputs. Yeah. So does this then somehow limit like what she is allowed to communicate because she could just communicate the inputs? Right. I think. Yeah, maybe you still need some assumptions on maybe how Alice and Bob are generating their inputs. Maybe you have some boxes that only leak a certain amount of information. And so Eve can get their inputs, but with some uncertainty. Y yes, but after like the devices are fed their inputs, they, they know the inputs. So they're not allowed to communicate those, I suppose. Right, right. They still cannot just simply communicate the inputs to Eve. Um, if they do, then we still assume that there is this uncertainty. Okay, yeah. so in that sense, it's limited what or until when the devices can communicate. Right. Um, So. 
Yeah, maybe we can take this offline, but I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm fine with that. I was just wondering. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's talk offline. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Then let's uh, thank Michand again for that great talk. <laughs>